Hi everyone, this is Clint from Persuasive Evangelism and I'm at Lake Sacagawea on this beautiful spring day. We're finally getting some sun. Um, and today we're going to go over this book, I Don't Have Enough Faith to Be an Atheist by Norman Geisler and Frank Turek. Um, I actually got this book f about four years ago um, when I was still living in LA. I started going back to church and I was reading several apologetic books, you know, a lot by John Lennox and others. And I was talking to someone at church um, about some of the books I was reading and he mentioned this book. Um, so, and I thought it had an interesting title. I had never heard about the author, so I ordered it. Um, and then it just sat on my bookshelf for several years because I had so many books to read. Um, and I, I didn't know anything about this book, so um, I kept putting it off to read it. Um, and then, like, probably a couple years ago, I discovered Frank Turk online. Um, he, do, he does uh, presentations on this. He goes to different college campuses and does a presentation on this book. And um, they're, in, they're great, the presentations. They're entertaining. He has a great sense of humor. And then he always does, like, a 20, 30-minute question and answer at the end and you know anyone can come up and ask questions and he's good at debating and quick um getting answers and so on but um and then i follow his uh youtube channel i think it's i think it's cross examine or reasons to believe i can't remember which one but um he does great interviews and he'll go over different topics um but this book I finally read. It took me a few weeks to read it. Um, there's so much great information in this. I totally recommend it. Um, and I was just taking my time. Um, it breaks, it's, I like how it's structured. It go, covers like a, like a lot of apologetic arguments and builds its case to, you know, if, if there's a God, if there is a God, you know, with all the different religions, what is the true religion? And then it builds it to Jesus and then what um, Jesus' death and resurrection. But um, I'm just going to read a couple things in this. So it says at the beginning, it says, Indeed, um, the five most consequential questions in life are these. One, origin. Where did we come from? Two, identity. Who are we? Three, meaning. Why are we here? Four, morality. How should we live? Five, destiny, where are we going? The answer to each of these questions depend on the existence of God. If God exists, then there's ultimate meaning and purpose to your life. If there's a real purpose to your life, then there's a real right and wrong way to live it. Choices you make now not only affect you here, but will affect you in eternity. On the other hand, if there is no God, then your life ultimately means nothing. Since there is no enduring purpose to life, there's no right or wrong way to live it. And it doesn't matter how you live or what you believe, your destiny is dust. Because as soon, as soon as you die, you don't exist anymore. Um, so here's the structure. Um, he goes over each of these points in depth. Um, I could actually do a video on each of these points, um, but this would be a great book for a Bible study to go over or something. But basically how they build their case is, number one, uh, truth about reality is knowable. There is truth. That's reality. Um, and then the, number two, the opposite of true is false. Three, if it, it is true the theistic God exists, this is evidenced by the A, beginning of the universe, B, design of the universe, C, design of life, D, moral law. Four, if God exists, then miracles are possible. Five, miracles can be used to confirm a message from God, i.e. as acts of God to confirm a word from God. Six, the New Testament is historically reliable. This is evidenced by A, early testimony, B, eyewitness testimony, C, uninvented authentic testimony, and D, eyewitnesses who were not deceived. Seven, the New Testament says Jesus claimed to be God. Eight, Jesus' claim to be God was miraculously confirmed by A, his fulfillment of many prophecies about himself that were written centuries before he lived, um, B, his sinless life and miraculous deeds, and then C, his prediction and accomplishment of his resurrection. He died on the cross and was re resurrected on the third day, um, and people witnessed that, and it changed their lives, and that was the beginning of Christianity, showing that he was God. He had the power over life and death. And he did that for to die for our sins so we could have a relationship with God and be forgiven. Um, and then nine, therefore Jesus is God. Ten, whatever Jesus who is God teaches is true. Eleven, Jesus taught that the Bible is the word of God. And then twelve, therefore it is true that the Bible is the word of God and anything opposed to it is false. So 
Um, all of these points, um, it covers it in a chapter or so and goes into great detail giving all these arguments, evidence, and so on. So that's the whole structure of the book. Um, and then I just want to go over one other thing. Near the end, the conclusion of the book, it says, I like this section, it says your destiny. Um, it says, who will, who will you serve? God leaves the choice in your hands. Love knows no other way. In order to respect your free choice, God has made the evidence for Christianity convincing but not compelling. If you want to suppress or ignore evidence all around you, including that which is presented in this book, then you are free to do so. But that would be a vol volitional act, not a rational one. You can reject Christ, but you cannot honestly say that there's not enough evidence to believe in him. C.S. Lewis said it best when he wrote, There are only two kinds of people in the end. Those who say to God, Thy will be done, and those to whom God says in the end, Thy will be done. All that are, all that are in hell, choose it. Without the self-choice, there would be no hell. No soul that seriously and constantly desires joy will ever miss it. Those who seek to find, those who seek find, to those who knock, it is opened. The door is being held open by Jesus Christ. How can you walk through it? Paul wrote, if you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified and it is with your mouth that you confess and are saved. You say, I believe that Jesus rose from the dead. Good, but merely believing that Jesus rose from the dead is not enough. You need to put your trust in him. You can believe that a certain person would make a great spouse, but that's not enough to make that person your husband or wife. You must go beyond the intellectual to volitional. You must put your trust in that person by saying, I do. The same is true concerning your relationship with God. Trusting him is not a decision of the head, but one of the heart. As, sometime, as someone once said, the distance between heaven and hell is about 18 inches. The distance between the head and the heart. What happens if you choose, if you freely choose not to walk through the door Jesus is holding open? Jesus said you will remain in your condemned state, for God did not send his son in the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already because he has not believed in the name of God's one and only son, John 3, 18. In other words, you'll remain condemned and separated from God forever. God will respect your choice by saying to you, thy will be done. So, yeah, this is a great book. This should be, if you're ever interested in apologetics, this is a one, one you should have. Um, and there's so great, so much good information in it. So I totally recommend this. And look him up online. He does a great presentation on this online on all these different college campuses and churches and great interviews he does and so on. Um, so uh, that's all for today. Thanks, everyone. Goodbye. God bless.